It will be for a while. Come away, my beloved. I'll teach you how to smile. Come away, my beloved. I am always here. Come away, my beloved. My presence is here. There's nothing I require of you. Nowhere to go and nothing you must do. I just want to be with you.
this moment, this time, this space. We give ourselves over to the stillness. We give ourselves over to the awareness of how very near the one presence is. We listen to these words from Osho. Love. God is far off because we don't know how to see God close by. In actuality, there is nothing closer than God. More than that, God is the here and the now. Words, names, doctrines, scriptures, religions, philosophies, all these are created often by those who can only see God at a distance. For those who can turn, drop down into the core, and drop the distant, <coughs> drop paradises in the sky, drop salvations in the future, <clears throat> and simply see the near the here, the now. See God here now. So take a few moments of silence. We're invited to feel and see and sense the nearness of God within us and around us. Breathe in and feel the nearness of God. We breathe out and we feel the nearness of God. We look around us right here, right now, and we see the nearness of God. We look into our own hearts and we see God. For all those we hold in our hearts, near and far, all those still living in physical and those beloveds living in non-physical, we hold our beloveds in our hearts, the two-leggeds, the four-leggeds, our beloved earth we hold in our heart, all life on this planet, the waters and the mountains, we hold in our heart. This is a time, if you choose to say the names of your beloveds out loud, to be in this healing space. of love, all of our human family, all those gathering in temples and synagogues and mosques, cathedrals and tiny churches all across this planet. 
our human family gathering in circles of prayer, dancing circles, singing circles, drumming circles, all those gathering together in community. <coughs> we continue to hold in our hearts of prayer all leaders, all world leaders that they have the capacity we know that we do as a human family, we have the capacity to make our decisions from wanting a world that works for all. We bless ourselves, all that we hold in our hearts. And we say, so it is, and so we let it be. Namaste. <coughs> Good morning. It's really, truly a miracle how the seats fill up and the service has started. Wow. I love all the snowy pictures Javier put on here today. We didn't know it was cold. We need to be reminded. That's Canada. That's <laughs> Canada. How many snowbirds do we have here, Liz? I'm just curious. We love our snowbirds. We are gathered today to talk about awe and wonder and radical amazement. Have you ever experienced radical amazement? Yes. <laughs> have you ever felt, you know, we capture these moments. We have have these moments that we remember, and they're often not associated with the birthdays, the weddings, the graduations. They're often the simplest moments. Have you noticed that? And they, they're like a video that we hold in our consciousness, and they're important moments. And often those moments are the moments that take our breath away. Either our hearts have broken, or more importantly, have opened. And we remember this moment where we're taken into a deeper place in our understanding. Radical amazement, awe and wonder. It can be at the birth of a baby. Is Sonia here today, our midwife? Catching the baby. She's with the kids. We, you know, the midwives, they catch the baby, a moment of awe. Have you ever been present? Well, I know many of you have had children, so you had to be there. <laughs> yeah. But for those of us who were not in pain, and, and you watch the moment happen, and there's awe, and there's wonder, isn't there? Ah, and then, if you're privileged enough to get the passing, And the awe of that moment, that instant, when you feel eternity, and there are no beginnings and no endings, simply the continual movement of life. And we get it. We might forget again. Our grief might take us away to forgetfulness again. But there's a moment we remember we can keep revisiting it. Eternity, right? Remember, I remember when we stood around Ed's body and we held hands. I remember the coroner and their team. They stood back, they watched. He told us later, we've never seen that before. We stood around beautiful Ed's body and we felt the holy moment, the moment of eternity. Hearts breaking, tears flowing, and we feel the moment. A moment of radical amazement. <coughs> My amazement is that we can remember, we can remember who we are, where we've come from, and it doesn't mean we have to get any kind of certification or any special training. We have the moments of remembering, a moment of radical amazement of who we are. Years ago, I worked in a children's hospital <coughs> where the schoolroom was down in the basement. I worked upstairs, but I would go downstairs in the basement because that's where miracles were actually happening. And there was a cleaning 
crew of people who would meet down in the basement every morning. And they were such people of faith. They would sing their songs and they would hold hands and they would have a prayer meeting. And I would go down there before I started my work day because their faith lifted me up. And you know what they did? They prayed for all the children in the hospital and all the doctors and nurses, all the team, they would pray every morning for everybody at Hope Haven Hospital. And then they would move throughout the day, throughout the hospital, with mops and food trays and the carts with the medications and the toys and the school books. And they would move into the rooms singing and telling stories. They got to know the kids. And they were not the official medical team. They were the ones creating miracles. So on Christmas Day, a young man came into Hope Haven Children's Hospital. He was 16 years old. He had been a, in a car accident. He was in a coma and not expected to live. So family gathered, and the whole, I call them the basement people, they started praying. And over the course of the next few weeks, next few months, we watched this young man, Ronnie, as he uh, began to show some eye movement. There was great hope that maybe he would wake up again. And he did wake up. He woke up. He had to learn to walk again. And he had to learn to speak again. And he had to learn to feed himself again. And I was down in the basement one day in the schoolroom, and he was in the wheelchair. He had not spoken a sentence yet. He had just hard, he could hardly understand him. His words just weren't quite there back yet. And this was in the early 70s. I remember we used to wear the platform shoes. <laughs> they looked like small boats on the feet. And uh, I think they've come back. And so, oh, Melanie and Charlene. <laughs> and so I had on these big white platform shoes that were about this big. And of course, a mini skirt. It was early 70s. And of course, a bouffant. Of course, a blonde bouffant. <laughs> We're in the uh, schoolroom, and Ronnie in the wheelchair, he fixates on my shoes. I remember this young man had not spoken, just maybe a word, no sentences. He fixates on my shoes, and it was quite peculiar. And the school teacher, Mrs. Shirt, she said, don't move, something's happening. Spirit's going to tell you that once in a while. <laughs> Don't move. Something's happening. Listen, pay attention. Something's happening. And suddenly, this young man, Ronnie, starts singing. On the wings of a snow white dove, he sent his pure sweet love. <laughs> From heaven above on the wings of death. And we were all, you know, the brain, you never know how it's going to kick in. White shoes, platform shoes, they had to be very large. <laughs> and he seized on the color white. And a song, somewhere from within his consciousness, he must have heard it since he was a little kid on the wings of a snow white dove, and then he started talking for now. Now, I had a moment of radical amazement. I had a moment of awe and wonder. We could not have planned that and made that happen, but something else took over. You can call it God, spirit, the miraculous consciousness, the miraculous presence within us. You call it whatever you want, but on the wings of a snow white dove, spirit will visit us and if we are really paying attention, we'll see it and we'll hear it. And
will allow ourselves to feel awe and wonder. Rabbi Heschel said, awareness of the divine begins with wonder. I wonder what it would be like if we could all sense the one presence within one another. I wonder what would happen in the world if we all started giving ourselves over to our own personal work of waking up more and more. I wonder, I wonder what it would be like to see heaven on earth. If we're not wondering, we're not creating it. If I'm not in wonder, then I'm in something else. And it's usually something like trying to control and figure stuff out and make things happen. And I know y'all have never done that, but <laughs> let me share my experience with you. <laughs> so Rabbi Heschel, talk about awe and wonder. Rabbi Heschel practiced what they call depth theology, not depth psychology, but depth theology. He said a theology that digs, that depth theology is a theology that digs beneath the dogmas and beneath the traditional formulations of religious traditions, which so often have served as substitutes for the root experiences of spirit. If we are not having an experience with spirit, then we haven't yet opened up our hearts. We're having an intellectual exercise and we're showing up to be entertained. But if we are really seeking an experience with spirit, then we will be in awe and wonder and radical amazement more and more often. I know about intellectual engagement with things of the spirit. Right? I used to could quote scripture, honey. You want to have a debate with me about religion and Christianity and being saved, oh honey, I could debate with you all day long. Because it's in the book, it's in the scriptures. But now I would rather have a conversation about the scripture writing going on in our own hearts. That's what I want to have a conversation about. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> so Rabbi Heschel, imagine this man seeking out the awe and the wonder and the radical amazement which he coined that phrase, that phrase, by the way, radical amazement. He was born in Warsaw, Poland in 1907, and he was teaching in Warsaw. He was deported by the Nazis, and he then got a position at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. I'm guessing, Harriet, that you met Rabbi Heschel. Yes, I'm guessing you and... No, you never met him. I know that Hugh was at Union. Yeah. Um, this is, these are the words of Rabbi Heschel. He says, I speak as a person who was able to leave Warsaw, the city in which I was born, just six weeks before the disaster began. My destination was New York. It would have been Auschwitz or Treblinka. I am a brand plucked from the fire in which my people were burning. He went on to live till 1972, taught many, many people uh, in the world, and he was also a big part of the civil rights movement and marched with Dr. Martin Luther King in Selma, which we've been talking about the last two Sundays. Now, when I look at a man like Rabbi Heschel, who continue to seek out awe and wonder and radical amazement even when his family was lost in the Holocaust. And people like Viktor Frankl. Hmm. You know, Viktor Frankl, who wrote um, the Man's Search for Meaning, thank you. You know, he and his wife were taken at the same time, and he, his manuscript that was sewn into his coat it was found, his life work, they burned. They, they burned all of his clothes. He couldn't even hold on to his wedding ring. But what he did, he had conversations with his wife and his consciousness. And they had conversations, we'll make it through this, hold on. And he said, 
If we can't change the circumstances around us, then we have to change what's going on within us. And that became his life work. Searching for meaning even in the midst of the appearances that all is lost. So he had these conversations in his mind with his wife for these years that he was in the death camps. And when he was released, he expected to see his wife. But in fact, she had died just a few weeks after she had gotten there. Wow. Now, I can't explain what happens in the human mind to, to the scientific satisfaction, but I can tell you that consciousness continues and it is possible to have conversation with those who are no longer in physical form. I know this, I've had the experience. And that's what Viktor Frankl was experiencing. He was engaged in life-saving conversation with his beloved wife, even though she had left the physical. It helped him to survive. That one little story alone is enough to take us into awe and wonder and radical amazement. And for myself, if I'm not feeling awe and wonder and radical amazement, I know that I'm too much into the place where we struggle and try to figure things out. Rabbi Heschel talked about the experience of the Shekinah. That when we have this experience of putting our attention to the one presence within us, we make ourselves available to the Shekinah. The Shekinah glory is the way the scriptures talk about it. Simply, it's the English spelling of a grammatically feminine Hebrew <coughs> word that means the dwelling or the settling. And it's used to denote the dwelling or settling in of divine presence. The way this was explained to me years ago, as I was speaking with a woman in the other chair, I heard myself say, we are invited to be fully in residence in this physical form. We are invited to fully incarnate into the physical body. And when we fully incarnate, then heaven is present on earth. We fully incarnate. The huge, magnificent spiritual being that we are into this tiny little space and time body. Shekinah. We experience the dwelling or the settling in of spirit. Let's take a deep breath in. We give permission for spirit to pitch its tent within us. We give permission for the Shekinah, the light, the glory, to take full residence within us. Rabbi Heschel said this, what we lack is not a will to believe, but a will to wonder at the beauty and grandeur of life. What we lack is a, a will to behold with awe and gratitude, and we also lack the encounter with spirit, the encounter with the transcendent, the meaning, the spiritual radiance of all that's going on within us and around us. A lot of us <coughs> talk ourselves into believing a really scary story. And it goes something like this. I have to figure this out. I'm on my own. Can't feel spirit right now. And I'm in a really scary place. And I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm going to struggle with that for a while. Some of us struggle with it our entire lifetime. So seeking the Shekinah means we, we decrease the time we spend in struggle and we increase the time we spend in knowing the one presence within. And for me, I think I'll choose nor door number two. But I want to feel the presence of Shekinah within me. I don't want to stay in the struggle. 
So, the, here's what Rabbi Heschel had to say. He said, It is impossible to be at ease and to repose on ideas which have turned into habits or canned theories in which our own or other people's insights are preserved. We can never leave behind our concerns in the safe deposit of opinions and beliefs, nor delegate its force to others. We must keep our own amazement, our own eagerness alive. We do not want to reduce our alive minds to mere series of cliches. And I was thinking about that. Every week we say, you are the light of the world. Every week we say, you know, there is one presence, one power within us. What if that becomes cliche? And what if we don't really feel it? You are the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. But if it becomes rote, like the Lord's Prayer, that's why we changed it to Aramaic. Because the Lord's Prayer becomes remote. I mean, it comes like rote. We just say the words, we don't even feel it. And it is remote. <laughs> and it comes, it's far, far away from us. But to know this one presence, one power, that's what we want, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we want. Isn't it? Yes. Is it? <laughs> Are we just here to be entertained? Nope. You know, church is theater. You do know that, right? <laughs> you do know that church is theater. And you go to some of the big cathedrals, it's high holy theater. <laughs> but we do. We dim the lights for meditation. We have the music. We read the poetry. We sing the songs. We have the encounter with different emotions and feelings that come up. Theater elicits all of that within us, and so does church. We know this. It's not a secret. But here's the deal. Some of us think that that's what it is, entertainment. Some of us human beings. Singing the beautiful songs. We have violin. Oh, my God. Violin. This is, this is high gear entertainment. <laughs> so let's step it up. What it's meant to do is open our hearts and open our minds. So on one level, it's great entertainment. But then something within us kicks in. We say, wait a minute, I'm here to take deep breaths, to open up my heart, the listening of my heart, to open up my spiritual eyes. That's what I'm here for. It gets, it gets lifted up from entertainment to a heart-opening experience of awe and wonder. At what? Awe and wonder of what? Somebody better say it soon. <laughs> of who we are. You know, last week we talked about my radical amazement the first time I saw chlorophyll moving through the vein of a leaf. This was radical amazement to me, people. This was a spiritual moment. This was one of those moments that collapsed into the here and now. And, oh my God. I am in a miraculous dimension. Again, the trees are breathing out oxygen so that I can breathe, and I breathe out carbon dioxide so they can breathe. I've got an interdependent love relationship with the trees. This, this is an, an amazing thing. And then we have our radical amazement now that we in this generation are able to see our neighbors. We thought one universe. <laughs> we still have it in the unity statement. There's one power and one presence in the universe. We've got to change that. There's one power and one presence in the multiverses. Because there's millions of them. Are you not amazed by this? Yes. Are you not amazed that we can see it? We're the first generation to see the Kodak moments. We are. We're the first generation to see that. However, the ancient ones always saw this. Kokopelli, the dancing spirit. This symbol's all over the rock garden in Australia. The symbol is everywhere. The circling, moving force of the life of spirit. It's constantly moving, but now we have the evidence. So take a deep breath. 
I now want to be radically amazed with you about this community. Is that okay? Yes. yes. Is it okay to be radically amazed at watching one another, all of us, watching ourselves wake up? Yes. yes. Is it okay to be in awe and wonder as we watch ourselves diminish the fear and increase the faith and the peace? Mm -hmm. Isn't that an awesome and wondrous thing? Yes, it is. I just want to be in awe. I want to behold ourselves. And you know, some of us in the Wednesday book group, we're studying this book, Self-Observation. I want to self-observe the community right now. You know, in Hebrew, there are many words for wonder, and there's not one word for doubt. So I wonder. I wonder what it would be like if you and I deepened our divine experiment with one another and how we're waking up and how we're showing up in the world. Because it seems that what we're observing is what we're creating. So if you and I are observing one another as the miraculous presence, then that's what we're going to create more of. Sunday morning circle. <coughs> How many of you are participating in Sunday morning circle? Y'all, there's a whole pre-church that goes on before church. And part of the pre-church is Sunday morning circle. And right now they're studying Return to Love by Mary Ann Williamson. But it really doesn't matter what they're studying. The energy of the people who come together to learn and deepen together, you walk through the fellowship hall to get your coffee. I walk in and I walk out and <laughs> I'm covered over with Shekinah. I'm covered over with the feeling of the dwelling, settling presence within that one little room in Surfside Beach called the fellowship hall at Unity. And then I come upstairs. Sue has already arrived, turning on the heat and the lights, practicing at the piano. And the musicians start arriving. And the sanctuary starts filling with Shekinah. Starts feeling, filling with the one presence, one power. It just gets more and more palpable. Joe sits on the back bench. We sit together. We watch and listen and we feel it's like filling up a tub with nice warm water soaking. It's like soaking in Shekinah. And service hasn't even started yet. <laughs> and then we've got Reiki. Last month in this room, you know, there's been one or two for First Tuesday Reiki, and that's been okay. The facilitators, they keep showing up. They keep showing up. And last Tuesday, last month, the first Tuesday, I heard that the Peace Chapel filled with people. They just kept coming, coming, and coming. You know, we did Reiki here for a lot of years, and then it stopped for a while, and now it's restarted. Word's gotten out. People are out here waiting for Reiki. Eileen said, they just kept coming. <laughs> because Eileen and Tammy have created a space, they've prepared a place. And then we have contemplative service. Sometimes there's a few of us, sometimes there's more than a few. What's happening is the energy is lifting. The energy gets deeper and deeper. Wednesday night contemplative service. Sometimes there's four or five or six or eight or ten. But with my eyes closed, I feel like the whole room has filled up. And every chair is full. The healing service. This Wednesday night, first Wednesday, there'll be a healing service in here. Olivia's not here today, but she will be here Wednesday night. <clears throat> Sound healing. Hands-on healing. I don't know if you all realize 
that this tiny little church has the biggest healing power happening. <laughs> Maybe you don't realize, but I invite you to open your hearts and minds to feel it because Shekinah is happening here. The dwelling place of the Most High. It's happening in this little wacky place next to a bar in Surfside Beach. <laughs> The oneness blessing happens in here. Wednesday is a big day here. Oneness blessing happening in here after the after the contemplative service and again on Sunday after the after the service is over. Oneness blessing to support us to feel the Shekinah. To bring our right left brain together. To help us to increase the open neural pathways so we have access to more of who we are. It's happening right here in River City. That's another place. It's happening, it's happening right here in Surfside Beach. And then we have our Wednesday book group, old people. We had 33 people in the book group last Wednesday. That's more than we used to have in the church. So, some of you know Diane, she comes to book group, she's rarely in a Sunday service, and whew, radical amazement and awe and wonder to watch all of us deepen into the expression of who we are, even when we're shy and don't want to say two words. Something gets hold of us, the Shekinah grabs hold of our feet and pulls us out of our hiding places and says, shine, would you please? <laughs> So, she had the audacity to write the author of the book. Have you ever written an author of a book? You know, I have, and if I get one sentence or one paragraph, how glorious. She got four pages and an email. He says, My dear Diane and self-observation study group, it is a thrill that all of you have become interested in studying yourselves. <laughs> There can be no possibility of the soul maturing in this lifetime unless I begin to study myself and come to know myself. This is the first and most important thing. So we thought that the most important thing was knowing God, right? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's a word coming to us. Oh, you know God. <laughs> are you saying we are God? Hey, the roof's still holding. <laughs> I am in God, God is in me as me. So every great culture has said two words, know thyself. Why? Because within us is the dwelling of the Most High. And we can't know the Most High, the dwelling of Shekinah, <laughs> until we give ourselves over to knowing of ourselves. Who knew? <laughs> Most of our religions have told us all the ways we should believe. <clears throat> and some of those ways have some truth and accuracy. But you may have noticed that some of the ways our religions have told us to believe have caused unkindness and separation from one another and from spirit. So the one way we're going to access truth is to learn how to work this biological system and understand how information comes through to us and to listen to it and express it and stop waiting for a priest or a minister to tell you it's okay to do it. So, Thursday we've got Course in Miracles. Are you kidding? How much more can one little building have? For those of you who haven't been to Course in Miracles, wait for it. The man facilitating, Mark Brennis, was with Judah Scutch when it was first transmitted the Course in Miracles in New York City. You don't just have somebody who's read a few books about the Course in Miracles. He was there when it was still a manuscript and not even printed in book form yet. Right here in this little wacky church next to a bar. How can 
this be happening? How is it we're finding one another? Course in Miracles, and then Friday, Art and Soul, anybody can paint, are you kidding? How many of us have been in this? How many of you now know you're an artist and you didn't know before? <laughs> There's magic happening in this class. People are talking. They're swapping stories. They're encouraging one another, uplifting one another. <coughs> Sorrows are shared. Happiness is shared. There's a word for this. It's called community. We share one another's sorrows and joys. We hold one another, we lift one another up, and we paint. Mm. Who knew it could be that simple? Classes, <coughs> workshops, concerts, dinners, and movies, and coffee houses, and healing circles, and drum circles, and special events online. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it important? Why is it important to pause now and then? You know, remember uh, Dances with Wolves and they went out for the buffalo hunt and they came back and they danced around the fire and they just kept telling the story over and over? Well, we need to tell the story now and then. We need to pause and reflect and be in awe and wonder at how spirit is expressing through this community and how people's lives are changing, not the least of which is mine. We are tasting God here. We are tasting the indwelling Shekinah. We're breathing in and breathing out what? God! The community observes itself. We are observing ourselves. In this book, Self-Observation, we're observing ourselves. The community also observes itself. We ask, what needs to be done? What needs to be uplifted? What needs to be cleaned? What needs to be hauled away? <laughs> what needs to be added? What is it we want to be? We ask these questions for ourselves personally, also as a spiritual community. What needs to be done? And how does that connect with what I have to bring into the world? The thing that this community yearns for, how does that match what I have to give? It's simple. It's simple. You want to see a garden grow, what do you got to do? You have to till it. You have to pull out the weeds. You have to upgrade the soil now and then. Add some fertilizer, organic, of course. <laughs> and you plant really good, healthy seeds. I've had my experiences with the dime store seeds. Oh, that dated me, didn't it? <laughs> the dollar store seeds. I now get my seeds from seed savers or heirloom seeds. I learned my lesson. I want it to keep blooming, keep giving forth healthy, healthy seeds. I have to begin with healthy seeds. The community observes itself and deepens into what wants to be expressed. Let's take a deep breath. What wants to be expressed? This church has been up to being unity for almost 30 years. This is our 29th year as Unity Church. I'm not sure how long the church has been here, but I know I've been here 10 years, and y'all were here for seven, eight, nine, or ten years, I don't know, before that. So what is it that we're moving into and want to be now? How is it that we create the space for Shekinah to dwell even more? How is it we listen to one another and encourage one another to express into the world in a way maybe you've never expressed before? Maybe you're an artist and you didn't know it. Maybe you wanted to be a backup singer and you didn't know it. Maybe you wanted to come to Unity and play the violin, but you didn't know it. How is it you want to express? And how is it you want this community to be here into the future when all of our physicality is long gone? But there's a presence called Unity. How is it we want that to happen? And who gets to decide that? 
You think I'm calling all the shots? Not true. There is an organic process of spiritual unfoldment. And I have learned, I think, y'all can let me know if I'm, a, if I'm an illusion. <laughs> I feel I've learned to stop trying to control how it's going to unfold and let it happen organically and watch what happens. And it can be a really scary place. <laughs> but watch who shows up. Like the Carlottas, like the Bows, like the Joannes, like the Peggy's, all the people that show up to add into what the spiritual community is becoming. And I've never done it this way before. <laughs> I've never trusted so much that a spiritual community can do the next right and perfect steps without struggle. Oh, is it like that every day, every moment, 24-7? Of course not. I have to go back to my spiritual knees often. Keep me open to radical amazement. Keep me open to awe and wonder. Don't let me go back to sleep. Let me stay open. So let's take a deep breath. And let's think about how you and I want to continue seeing this community in a place of health and well-being. What is it we're going to do? You know, you've got your February schedule in your chairs. There's a lot coming up. But I want you to think about what's coming up over the next 10 years, 5 years, 3 years. What's coming up for this community? What's happening? We're watching lives change. How do we want to keep this atmosphere long after we're all gone? <coughs> Thinking ahead. Mayher Baba, who established the Baba Center in the mid-40s, knew that there would come a time in the world when we human beings would yearn for silence. He knew we weren't all going to convert to some religion that he might have come out of. He didn't expect all of us Westerners to start wearing the robes of the East and sitting in silence in a cave for 40 days and 40 nights. He just knew that we were going to need a place for quietude, for silence. Mid-40s. That place is rocking now. <laughs> People are coming from all over the world to the Baba Center. In Myrtle Beach. Myrtle Beach. And they find their way to the Baba Center because there was a vision in the mid-40s of what the world was going to yearn for. What will the world be yearning for 40 years from now? And I can tell you, unity is going to be a part of it. Unity is a part of a new kind of spiritual expression. And we don't know exactly what to call it yet. Right now, we're still calling it New Thought. But I'm with you wanting to open to the deeper, clear expression of the Shekinah. And I don't know exactly what that looks like, but we all do. And somebody thanked me before service. They said, thank you for doing what you do here on Sunday morning. And I reminded that person, it is a collaborative process. I hear and sense and feel and see the energy and I hear the thoughts and I feel the feelings and we're all collaborating and I just get to put the words to it. I hope y'all know that's how it happens. <laughs> okay, let's take a deep breath because we're going to move into the next sacred part, which is the receiving of the offering. And the band's going to come up. The band. <laughs> I love being able to say that. The band. <laughs> And you know, these people are volunteer. We, we pay Dave Lacombe a very minimal amount to be the director and hold things together. And they all show up, Dave Lacombe and all of them, giving their hearts on Sunday morning. It used to be so sad, the music here. <laughs> and we had a vision, we had a vision. You know what we saw? We saw a unity band. We saw a unity band. And 
look at it. There they are. That's how that happened.